Good morning, IWC. Good morning to our people here in 1077 St. James and to everyone watching us online. Good morning. Uh, why don't we stand today and prepare to worship the Lord? And if you're in your homes, it would be nice to stand up and prepare our hearts for worship as well. So here's the worship team. Without your love, slave to the darkness. If he wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your kindness, chased me down when I was lost. Where would I be if he wasn't for the cross? And hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner, now I'm not. And with your blood, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. Oh, thank you for the cross. Oh, my shame was met with mercy. Now your mercy will be my song. Oh, the glory, oh, the power of the cross, oh, and hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not going with your blood, you and brought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. And by your stripes I'm healed. And by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome. It is finished. It is done. By your stripes I'm healed. And by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome. It is finished, it is done. By your stripes I'm healed, and by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome. It is finished, it is done. And by your stripes I'm healed, and by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome. It is finished, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not focused with your blood. You brought my freedom. Hallelujah for the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm not Cause with your blood You brought my freedom Hallelujah for the cross Oh thank 
thank you for the cross, Jesus. Oh, thank you for the cross. Jesus, um, we just want to thank you for who you are. We just want to thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord God. And we don't just celebrate that once a year. Um, we celebrate that every day of our lives, Lord God. Um, 
your gospel is what we live every day, Lord. And I pray that we would learn to live that every day. Holy Spirit, just pour out on us and help us to remember that. Remember your goodness. Remember what you did for us, God, every single day. Um, we just give you all the praises and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning, church. Um, good morning to our beautiful faces here at 1077 St. James. Um, before you sit, why don't we just look in the back, try a big wave. <laughs> yeah, you can be seated. And if you're um, in our Facebook page right now watching us live, good morning as well. If you're coming from another part of the world, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are right now. Um, my name is Denby, and I am your MC for today. You're seeing double of me from the worship, and here I am again. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, today is a very special day because, as you guys don't already know, today is the last day of our captivated um, seven-day prayer and fasting. Um, and if you guys participated in that, here at church, can I see a... Uh, raising the hand, yep, seeing the hands. And if you're um, watching us online, why don't you put in the comment box a praying emoji? Can we find that? Yep, praying emoji. And so speaking of our culmination for the captivated um, prayer and fasting, tonight we are going to have a breaking of the fast, a celebration night through Zoom, and that is at 7 p.m., um, you guys can find it on our Facebook page if you scroll down um, and find the, the post that talks about the celebration night and the prayer meeting on Thursday. You will see it there. Just click the link and you'll be in at 7 p.m. tonight. So put an alarm on your phones and be there and I will see you there. And another announcement we have is the midweek refuel with Pastor Gigi. Right now we are already on on to chapter 11. So that will be on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So put an alarm on your phones as well for, for Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, it will be through our Facebook page. And yeah, just watch the video in there. And yeah, and a new announcement that we have is um, besides our regular Tagalog and English service, we are going to have two new worship services that will be ongoing starting May. So starting on May 1st, Saturday, we will have an English service at 6 p.m. And this will be led by the Northgate um, team. And also for the May 2nd, so that's a Sunday, besides the Tagalog and English we have in the morning, we will have another service at 2 p.m. Um, and that is led by tr the Transcona team. So if you guys have been planning or been wanting to attend those services, um, there will be a pre-registration and just watch out on the Facebook page for that. And yeah, so we've gone to our giving portion. Um, we've been so blessed by all the giving that you guys have done. And yeah, and we declare that God is even blessing us more um, through ourselves and with the church. And yeah, we just want to thank you for that. And yeah, um, there's a lot of ways to give online through the IWC website, through the Tithely app. If you guys haven't downloaded that already, it is very convenient and it takes three seconds to do it. Um, I've been I've been giving through there, and yeah, in other ways as well. There's a there's a Dropbox outside, so you can also drop off your um, tithes and offering over there. Yeah, so let us just pray uh, quickly for yeah. Um, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord God, um, that you have been very, very um, giving, God, that you are a generous God. Um, Father, that, um, yeah, that you've provided us in the past. Father, that you are providing us right now, whether we know it or not. And God, that you are providing us even in the future already. And I pray, God, that we just learn to trust in that. Father, we pray that, yeah, that we would believe more and more of your goodness and of your provision for us, God. And yeah, I just want to pray for Pastor Juni as well as he preaches today, Lord. Um, I pray that, um, yeah, that he will be um, your hands and feet, Lord God, that whatever comes out of his mouth will, will bless um, everyone who's watching right now. 
God, and that we will learn to apply that in our own lives. Um, God, prepare our hearts and prepare our minds today. Um, we give you back all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. We can search all our lives trying to find a purpose for all this. We can keep walking and walking and walking, yet still feel empty and still feel lost. We say there's got to be a reason, a way to live our lives with direction. I can show you the gift of salvation, the promise of joy. In me, there's freedom, for I paid the ultimate price. Come, this is the way. I am the way. Yeah, this morning I greeted in Tagalog and they responded in English. So now, this, thank God you did not respond in Tagalog, but responded in English. That's amazing. Good morning to those who are also watching online and probably good evening to those who are on the other side of the globe. Thank you for joining us this morning. You know, I'm excited because this series to me is very, very personal. It has impacted my life before I actually even crafted the outline and, 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 and preached it to you. And what you heard, the over, uh, over what do you call it, over, voiceover um, guy said that the promise of freedom and joy. I think this is a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like rare that we see in a lot of Christians. Because, you know, the problem with Christianity nowadays is that there is a discrepancy, a gap between belief and behavior. And for the most part, belief is also flawed. It's not what it ought to be. It's not the right belief. It's not the right faith in Christ. And, 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 and many of us, if not most of us, Christians, especially in a free world, in a very affluent world, we only think of Christ as a source of material and financial blessing and ease. Literal, we're talking about convenience and comfort, which is actually, you don't see that in the Scriptures. You don't see that in the New Testament life, in the New Covenant life. You see people who have given their lives willing to be tortured, crucified, and in the process still, you know, they enjoyed peace. They enjoy the joy of the Lord. It's not based on the outward circumstances. And that's why the Scripture found in Philippians chapter 4.13, the context of that is that, you know, I, 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 uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was saying that I have learned to be content both in lack and in plenty. You got that? It's not like, oh, just uh, I want to do something in my life pleasurable to me, then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, he lived a life according to the purpose of God, and he lived it with such joy and power and strength, even if he lacked money or resources, or he had more than enough. That's what Philippians 4.13 was all about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, to the series, we actually, I would like to go back and focus ourselves to the objectives of this series, right? Number one, the Lord Jesus is our way to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's no other way except Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Meaning, we approach God by approaching Jesus first. That's why we approach God by approaching Jesus as our Savior, the only one He can bring forgiveness of our sins, bring righteousness and right standing before God by His death on the cross, and then make Him also as our Lord and Savior. Meaning, it's not just save me, then I'll live my own life. You're not, you're not saved to live your own life. You're saved from rebellion and independence so that you can live for God. And so you accept in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And therefore, He's the one who brings you to the Father. He's the one who brings you to a closer relationship with God who is a holy God. And He gives us the Spirit whereby we cry, 
Not just Lord Jesus, but also Abba Father, Father, Father. Okay? So we pray to Jesus, we pray to the Father at the same time. Okay? That's a given. So this is the first objective. The new covenant in the grace of God through Jesus Christ is about intimacy with God. It's the same objective in the old covenant, but it was by self-effort. Self-effort. Human strength to obey the law or the laws of Moses. And then animal sacrifice to be forgiven of our mistakes or sins in the old covenant. Here, Jesus offered the sacrifice once and for all. Perfect. No more need for another sacrifice and done over and over. Second objective is that the Lord Jesus Christ as our way of life. The word walk, live are all the same. They all have the same meaning, meaning that's your life. That's your way of life. That's your behavior. That's what you're accustomed to be doing, saying, thinking, and behaving. Just your way of life. So having Jesus is not just our way to the Father. He's also the one who provides us a new way of life, a heavenly life, a God-infused, infused, empowered. You know the word enthusiastic? In theos, okay, it's a God-infused moment or a God-infused life. Kaya nga, en, teo is God, enthusiastic. It's a life bubbling with joy and peace and excitement and hope, okay? He provides us from the inside when we become born again, when we become intimate with God through His Son Jesus by His Spirit. He provides us a new way of life. A victorious life over sin. A free life from sin. Free from the condemnation of the law. Free from the heavy burden of the law that no human being can perfect and obey everything and be pleasing to God. To be free from demonic oppression, influence, and possession. To be free to enjoy the joy of God, the peace of God, the love of God, all the goodness of God. Free. It's free. You're not striving to get it. It's free. He provides us a new way of life, a way of grace, a way of God's mercy, a way of God's power and love. Okay? Let me tell you, how does free work? If I give you 50 bucks each, would you have to roll over, bend, cry before you get it? No, it's free. What do you do? Thank you. You receive it and thank you. That's why... You know, we need to know what's in the will and testament. And from there, ask. Not be OA. Don't overact. Probably if you're just struggling and anxious, you pour it out your heart. But eventually, believe it's yours because God says it. It's in the testament. It's in the will and testament. It's in the covenant. It's in the contract. And then you receive it with thanksgiving. That's why if you look at the context of prayer written by Paul in his epistles, he's always connected with thanksgiving, thanksgiving, thanksgiving. Be vigilant in prayer with thanksgiving. With thanks- Why? It's free. The grace of God is free. When you receive free, you're thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You don't sweat it out. <laughs> yeah, this is mind-blowing, right? This is a paradigm shift. Because even as Christians, we're still resorting back to the law, resorting back to self-effort, to striving, to working it to be, get, to be approved. That's why Paul, most of the time, he wrote scriptures, or he wrote his epistles to refute the returning to be under the law, to be uh, circumcised and do everything that's in the law because the Jews of his time who became Christians wanted to impose their superiority over the Gentiles. It's not about intimacy with God. They just want to be superior because they have been, they have been superior for millennia. <laughs> For thousands of years. And rightly so. That's why you look at you look at David. How dare you defy the armies of the living God? You uncircumcised Goliath. You have no God. Your God is a false God. We have the real God. We are in covenant relationship with God, proven by our being circumcised. And that's why he won, because God is the true and living God, and God backed up that covenant. Not by natural means, but supernatural means. He carried that pebble, that small stone, and right there on the forehead and buried it in that brain. And, and Goliath fell. That's supernatural. That's the, 
covenant keeping God. I'll protect you from your enemies. I'll defeat your enemies. One will put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight. That's supernatural. That's the God who is mindful of his covenant, faithful to his covenant. And so now in the new covenant, because in the old covenant, it was not possible to really be intimate with the holy God. He's so holy, thrice holy, unique, transcendent, not common, above all else, without sin, so pure. The animal sacrifice was tainted with sin. The animals were tainted with sin. There was no perfect sacrifice. And so it was, it was impossible to be intimate with the holy God. Much more have the victorious life. Much more have a holy life. So now we come into the grace covenant. It's all provided for the sacrifice, the means to overcome sin and overpower the devil. It becomes a way of life by just simply receiving by faith and being grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Okay? And third objective, our way of life as an example to help others find their way into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the problem because of so many scandals, so many embarrassments, and so many, not, not just in the big, big stage, but in the day-to-day -day Christian encounter of non-Christians, many non-Christians do not want to become Christians because of the inconsistency of our faith and our practice, our behavior. They watch us and see if there's any difference. But when we live in Christ, through Christ, for Christ, in His power, then we can see His life, our way of life, becoming an example, and it will, and it will be an example to others to find their way into Christ, and then they find their way into God the Father, and then God provides them a way of life. They become an example. You see the domino effect? You don't even need to impose or you don't even need to impress with so many knowledge of the scriptures and verses. I'm not, I'm not saying don't read the Bible, memorize the Bible. No, you don't read it out of obligation or rules-based reading. No, you do it out of that strong relationship with God. You want to read more and more and more to know Him intimately. Remember what I told you the story of the, the woman who married the loving second husband without knowing she was already obeying the 25 laws of her first husband because of her gratitude and appreciation and love to that second husband. Strong relationship provides you the ability to do the rules. Without that strong relationship, the rules are impossible to obey and a heavy burden to carry. You got this? And that's what the new covenant provides. That's what Jesus provides. I am the way, go to my Father, be close to my Father through me, and then that closeness provides you a powerful life, a powerful way of life, that rules and laws of God, the moral laws of God, are seen more in you than the one trying hard on his own. Are you with me? And he reads one chapter, and there's so much revelation, illumination. You've been reading 10 chapters and nothing comes to you. Because you're a carnal. You're not interested with intimacy with God. You're just interested with rules, with superiority. You're like the Jewish Christians of Paul's time who imposes the laws, the circumcision, so that they would be considered superior than the Gentile Christians. And so this is what this series is all about. Okay? Enjoy a restful, peaceful, powerful Christian life. That is not hypocritical, but consistent in our belief, in our behavior, and the world sees it, they're attracted to it, they ask you, how do I get to know Jesus? I see Him in your life. Amen? So now, before I go to the main text, when, we, when two per persons get married, before they get married, they have to ask difficult questions. And if they don't ask difficult questions, questions, this is where counseling comes into play. Because we as counselors, Pastor Bong and I, Pastor Gigi, Pastor Jerome, you know, uh, we have, uh, we have set, a set, set of questions. In fact, the previous one that we had, 75 questions, both of them would answer it separately without asking each other what the answer was or what were their answers to those, uh, uh, each question. 
they would write their own question, uh, answer to their questions, to the questions, and then on the other side, what they think would be the answer of their fiance. And then come counseling, they would be able to see and discover, oh, there's a big difference, or, 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 or we're compatible here. We also have a SIMBIS program, a very scientific, scientific approach to see the differences, what complements, and many others. In fact, you would see graphs and conclusive um, um, a statement on the response of both to the questionnaires, the questionnaire, okay? And then the counselor will come and kind of sort it out, explain it. It's kind of prep preparation to, you know, before you say, I do. So we, couples, the man and woman, they need to ask the tough questions. In fact, when there's a rich person, probably a widower or a widow marrying a younger person, and then he or she, you know, she has kids and from the first wife, there's, there's possibility of prenuptial agreement. And I think that's okay for the sake of the children, right? Because that is like a, a conjugal property and, and estate of the, the husband and wife, or the husband or the wife who lost the spouse. And those. So therefore, it's okay, like how much or what percentage do I leave to my family? And then what is left to me, okay, for my new wife. But basically, the, the mentality of marriage, the principle of marriage is what is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. But there has to be questions, tough questions that we need to ask. Well, for example, who's going to cook? Right? Who's going to manage the finances? There are so many questions. Do we need, do, are, we going to church to, are we going to this church, especially if the two persons are from different churches? Okay? And so let me encourage you, if you're single and you're like dating with somebody from another church, then just tell them, um, IWC is it. Okay, so who said it? Pastor Bong. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you pray about it. That, that's the, the real thing. I'm just kidding about the other one. Pray about it. Okay, what church do we go? How many kids are we ca capable of caring for? Ask those tough questions, right? Where do we live? Do we live with our parents, your parents, my parents? And here comes the counselor, right? The counselor said, leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife. You want less problem? Stay away from any parent. Live on your own. I'll give you an example. Baby boy. You're living with baby boy's parents. The baby boy of mama. Mama's boy. And then mama's boy sees the wife berating her new husband. What do you think? Mama will feel about mama's boy. Mama's boy will feel bad. Mama's boy will come as an outlaw and attack new wife. Why? Because you're exposed. You don't, you don't, you don't do it on your own by leaving and cleaving and learning to grow together into becoming one flesh principle. So, our advice, which is biblical, leave parents and cleave. Oh, we want to save money. Well, save your peace. Save their peace. Save your parents from trouble. Are you with me? Save them from trouble, from, from seeing you guys fighting or whatever. Save that. Don't give them stress. And learn on your own. You chose to give, be married. Don't be, stop being dependent. Are you with me? And then I even talked to parents, and I said, parents, this is the time to let them go. You can advise, but do not demand. Just advise, pray, do not demand. They are no longer under your authority. They are now under each other's authority. And so if I say that to your parents, and yet you live with them, that is actually conflicting and contrary to the principle of leaving and cleaving. Right? The possibility of them getting involved is big. And that's trouble for the marriage. So ask tough questions. And in fact, we ask tough questions so that before they say, I do, they know what they are going to say, I do for. This is not a Las Vegas wedding. I saw you, you saw me. I saw the curly eyelashes. I saw the sparkling white teeth. Let's go to the chapel and get married. No, you can ask. Are your eyelashes fake or true? Ask. Show it. Show it if it's not true. Okay? And then 
take it or leave it. Or uh, you're, do you have a complete set of teeth? Are they all like real? No fake teeth? No, no, no teeth inside the glass when I wake up? I remember Fatty and my wife when after we got married, after some time, after the honeymoon, after the dust settled, she looked at me and said, oh, you have, a, you have one missing tooth. I didn't see that when we were dating. Because she was blinded to the aura of this young man. But when the dust settled and cloud nine became cloud zero, in the moment I smiled, hi, how are you? Boong eh. <laughs> but she still loved me. And thank God for technology and uh, uh, insurance, dental insurance, it was covered. Literally, financially, and physically. <laughs> so I can smile. Hello. Ask tough questions before you say, I do. And so now, instead of just sitting down there listening and then forgetting about this, it's time for you to go through a test, an examination to prove what you know. If you really know anything about this is the way, about the new covenant of God's grace in Christ Jesus. And how victory in Christ really works. And if it's something that you want applied in your life without a sweat. Actually, without a sweat. You know, that one of the most um, distinguishing word, one of the dis di distinguishing words in the new covenant that is opposite in the old covenant is rest. In the old covenant, it's strive, striving, working hard. In the new covenant, rest. <laughs> but you're doing more. You're doing more than in the old covenant. In the old covenant, self-power. In the new covenant, Holy Spirit power. Resurrection power. And you feel rested, but you're doing more. You're obeying more. You're producing more fruits. Not self-works. Fruits. Okay? It's a powerful life. And so, we have to start asking questions and answering those questions. Okay? This is your examination. This is your test. We have to ask tough questions. Now, before we go and ask tough questions and real questions, let's go to our main text found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 24. Remember Galatians? You know, Galatians is the easiest word or book in the Bible because my favorite game is Galactians. Second is Pac-Man. Old school. Galactians. And there's like bees going down. And the other one, the Pac-Man. Literally, I bought a Nintendo game in Minneapolis way many years ago. And it's all just old classic games. Okay? Yeah, Gal Galatians. Like... Sometimes I'm mistaking Galatians. It's Galatians, the church in Galatia. You remember Galatians chapter 5? It's about circumcision. Paul was saying, don't be circumcised because if you become circumcised like the Jews, then you are now obligated to obey the law, to be under the law, no longer under grace. If you go back to rules-based life, instead of intimacy with Jesus, you are now estranged, severed, disconnected from Christ, and therefore you have fallen from the grace of God. Free gifts. You're trying to earn it again. Instead of just receiving it and be grateful for the free stuff. Righteousness. Intimacy with God. Power over sin. Purposeful, fruitful life. Those are all free. Joy, peace, these are spiritual blessings, but they're free. This is what a lot of us are trying to do with free stuff. Oh, I will be patient. I will be patient. Yeah, here's, my, here's my nemesis. Here's my attacker. I'll try to be patient. Ooh. <laughs> and then here he comes from a kilometer away. You start berating and attacking. And, uh, you're trying hard. To overpower yourself. That's not the way the new covenant works. It's not the way grace works. Grace works simply by surrender, receive, and be grateful. 
Are you with me? Because all are, have been provided for, for free. It's free. Jesus paid for it. All you have to do is receive it. Know it first. Find it in the New Testament. Find it in the New Covenant. Find it in the Bible. And then claim it when you need it. And then be thankful. Be vigilant in prayer. Pray according to God's will. And if you pray according to God's will, then you have the confidence that God will hear you and you will have your prayers answered. And so be thankful even before you see a drop of that physical blessing or spiritual blessing be on your lap. And God who is faithful to His covenant, who is mindful of His covenant, will do it. He'll do it. Just be grateful. So now here, the result of being um, focused on the law, trying to obey the law, self-effort, self-righteousness, and then pride, results in biting one another. Paul said, yes, be free from the law, the consequences of the law, the condemnation of the law. But let not your freedom be an, uh, a license to bite each other, to attack one another. But in love, love one another the way you love yourself. So Paul is saying, I say then, this is how it's done. You got this? It's not by circumcision. It's not by trying to obey the laws of Moses. No, it's not by being superior against, one another, against, against others. No. I say then, walk in the Spirit. That is his solution. The word walk is the same as led. The word walk, led, if you go to the original word, it means your life, way of life, your behavior. But this is more than just your way of life. This is you being pulled by the locomotive power of the Holy Spirit. It's not you, okay, not connected to the Spirit, Spirit following the laws on your own. No, the train pulled by the locomotive part, the front. That's the power of the, the engine pulling everything behind. That is what it means to be walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, led by the Spirit. It's the Spirit's power pulling you, empowering you, enabling you. It's not your self-power, self-effort. That's why it's not a struggle. That's why it breaks my heart. And I'm not saying out of pride. I'm saying it out of compassion. But I, because I have learned this new covenant life. I have learned this new covenant of grace. I have learned this walking in the spirit by first knowing how wicked, how weak I am on my own. And I brought it all to Christ and put my confidence in the power of Christ, the finished work of Christ. And now I am not trying to pull all of the train that I have, I'm being pulled by the power of the Spirit. You get this? Okay? And you shall not fulfill, what? If we walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh that is against God. Let me give you a drawing here. The word flesh is from the Greek word sarx that are actually having two meanings, the physical body. And the physical body being the seat of sin. That is a sinful nature. So this is, now I'm not a fine arts graduate, so sorry, I'm an engineer. Or I was an engineer, so we used rulers and triangles to draw. Pastor Bong and I. So fine arts, oh man, they beautiful. So don't complain about my drawing. So this is the flesh, okay? Both the physical body and the eye, in that flesh that only thinks about itself, only thinks about the world around it, the life of the world, which the Bible said, the lust of the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So it is not concerned about heaven. It is not concerned about the Holy Spirit. It's not concerned about the kingdom of God. It's not concerned about spiritual things. It's concerned about the five senses. Okay? Never concerns itself about God even if it's religious. Again, let me state, it can be religious and deceivingly religious, but does not really concern itself of God. Now, we also have the soul. The word soul is the Greek word psyche. What is the word psyche? Psychology, mind, mental. And it includes emotions. This to tag team. You know tag team, they're partners. 
baby comes out, baby in an upbringing, an environment that programs the mind, mindset, mindset, mindset connected to the surrounding, the world, the community, the family, the culture he is in or she is in, okay? And then the needs of the body, the wants of the body. And then that produces emotions. Let's say if you grew up in an angry home, the father is always angry. It's both a mindset and an emotion. So what happens to you as a child? You grow up in that environment, you also produce a mindset of easily irritated, and then it has these emotions that, come with, that comes with it. Are you, are you getting the picture? That's why the manifestation of the flesh varies from person to person, but they're all sinful, lustful desires, uh, egotistical attitude against God. You got it? We are a trichotomy, right? Body, flesh, sarx, soul, psyche, and then we have a spirit, the one that connects to the spiritual realm. Spiritual realm, not the physical realm. It connects to the spiritual realm, either God or Satan, either angels or demons. And actually, there's no fence in the spiritual realm either. There are no demons that are actually half angelic, a bit good. And there are no angels that are like, oh, it's 85% godly angels and then 15%, a little bit of uh, demonic. The picture that I see is that whoever crosses this line, especially the good, they are automatically becoming what? Part of Satan. Nobody from the part of Satan, the, the demons of Satan, can cross again to the other side. There's no repentance for angels. And thank God for us, there is repentance. But in the physical realm, we can hide. That's hypocrisy. Uh, uh, lukewarmness, 50-50. But you know, in the spiritual realm, the devil knows who is really gods or who are compromising. And God knows who really is His and not compromising or those who, is, those who are compromising. And so now there's a, there's a the spiritual result that can be seen in the, in the physical because of that decision of the heart, decision of the will, will, okay? So now if you're not yet born again, you're dead. You're dead in the, your, your spirit is dead, meaning severed from God. You're disconnected from God then your spirit is being influenced, oppressed, and possessed by Satan. So what happens here? Your whole, your whole being is just simply evil, stress, anxiety, peacelessness, hopelessness, suicidal, all kinds of thoughts. Okay? I'm not talking about that there's probably any, a, 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 a chemical imbalance. It's biological. That needs treatment. But some, if not most of the time, are actually spiritual in root. Okay? So now this spirit needs to be born again to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He makes it alive. And based on his death on the cross, it connects you to God. And so what happened, Satan now has no place in your spirit. But this is where Satan fights. Satan is a headhunter. Satan fights in your psyche trying to awaken the old mindset. In the spirit, you have a new mindset, the mindset of Christ. You read the Bible, you pray, you worship, you do all the things that will feed your spirit, then it overpowers the psyche, if it overpowers the emotions, and it overpowers the flesh. Your body is still alive, but the I in that flesh has been overpowered by the spirit. Now you are displaying in that body the way of life of Jesus the victory of Jesus. Are you getting the picture? But you know, the problem that's happening in the Christian's life is not about, oh, ang lakas ng, ng, ng soul, ang lakas ng mindset, ang lakas ng flesh. The flesh is so strong. Satan is so strong. We are overstating them, those, those dudes. The flesh, the mindset, and the devil. We are overstating their strength and power. The problem is not that they are strong. The problem is not that the Holy Spirit is weak and, and, and struggling against the flesh. The problem is our indecisiveness. That's the struggle. Indecisive. In your commitment. And I will read further, okay? I want this 
digested piece by piece so you guys get this. Because if you get this, your life will be easier and better. Not in your ability, not in my ability, but in the power of the Spirit. It doesn't mean that there are no longer storms. No, there are actually more storms. But you face the storms in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the flesh is no good to the power of the Holy Spirit. See, when you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill, see, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh lust or desires against what the Spirit desires, and the Spirit against the flesh and they, these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Why? If you are in the middle, there's indecisiveness, then, then that's the struggle. But that can be dealt with easily. Easily if you're willing to respond favorably to the questions I'll be asking you. But if you're led by the Spirit, see, walk in the Spirit, led by the Spirit. You are not under the law, meaning you're not trying to strive and work on your own to please God, to obey the law, and then be condemned by the law. No, you are not under that law. You are under the law of God's grace and love. And it's the Spirit who's enabling you to receive God's free gifts, the grace, the forgiveness, the righteousness, and the power to overcome the flesh so that you can obey. See, the problem is not in the obeying. The problem is the weakness of our flesh. That's what Paul said. The good that I want to do, I cannot. The evil that I don't want, I cannot. I can. That's what I'm doing. See, it's not. <laughs> it's not the obeying. That's the problem. The problem is the weakness of our flesh. This body, the soul, the body that's all about the world, the self, the lust, the I, the me, the ego. That's why you cannot obey. And so when that is dealt with by the Spirit, then you can obey God. Simple. Right? Now the works of the flesh, see, say to me, works. It's different from the Spirit. Because it's something you produce on your own, and it's not pleasing to God. God is not present in your flesh when, when you want just the fleshly desires and activities and works controlling you. Okay? And those are works that are not going to be acceptable to God. You can be religious all you want, but it's still, if you're in the flesh, if you're carnal, if you're worldly, you're not led and living in the Spirit, then it will not be acceptable to, acceptable to God. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. You can see this. You can see it at home. You can see it at work. You can cover it up with verses. You cannot actually cover it up for a long time. If people live with you and people see you, work with you, they would know you are fleshly. You're not a good example as a Christian. Which are adultery, see, sexual immorality. You're married and you're having sex with not your spouse. Who's not your spouse. That's adultery. Fornication. You're having sex and you're not yet married. Premarital sex. Uncleanness, meaning your, your filthy thoughts and filthy words coming out of your filthy heart. Jesus said, out of the heart comes out of the mouth. Lewdness, the same thing. Similar. Idolatry. Idolatry is not just worshiping false gods. You know, this could be something that a Christian creates a different Jesus, a, a different gospel. You know what Paul said in Galatians? If somebody preaches a, a different gospel, a different Jesus, even if it's me, even if it's an angel, let him be accursed. If it's the gospel of just prosperity, it's all convenience, money, Material things, that's not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you follow Jesus, there's no guarantee you'll have lots of money. There's no guarantee that you will have, you will have material, uh, um, a lot of, lots of material stuff or a convenient life. But there's a guarantee you will be provided for by God, whatever your need may be. And if ever you have an excess, it is for being rich in good works. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I have scanned the Bible. There is no promise of everybody becoming a millionaire. By giving uh, $10,000 and you'll become a millionaire. There's no, nothing in the new covenant. There's nothing in the new covenant. In the coven, old covenant, there, there was. It's a, different, it's a different dispensation and for different purpose. But in this dispensation, just like Jesus, in this era, in this, in this covenant, is to show victory over sin, over the devil, over the world. A world that loves convenience and comfort and and wealth, and, 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 and pride, and to overcome that. Are you with me? Is this clear to you? 
It doesn't mean that God doesn't provide. No, He provides. He provides your need. He provides our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Okay, but not the promise of everybody becoming a millionaire, everybody becoming a multimillionaire. No, it's not. Are you with me? So, idolatry can be a wrong Jesus, a wrong gospel, not just like worshiping false gods, sorcery, witchcraft, voodoo. And you might be saying, I don't do this stuff. No. What about hatred? They're all in, the, they're all in that flesh. They're all in that carnal human nature, but different manifestations, sometimes if not most of the time, according to your upbringing, culture, and background. There's hatred. That's why there are Christians who are born again and are full of hate. Still. Why? They're carnal. We're carnal. Contention. See, quarrels. Quarrelsome. You can be a Christian and carnal. I can be a Christian and carnal and be quarrelsome. Easily agitated, easily offended. Yet, he knows a lot of verses. He, she knows a lot of Bible stuff. But that doesn't cover it up because it comes out. You want to know a person who is really spiritual or carnal? Drive with that person or ride with that person in Manila in one minute, in five minutes. See if there's any hatred or outburst of wrath. <laughs> self is ambition. It's all about self. Dissensions, divisions, heresies. Now, heresy, what is heresy? You know, this is an eye-opener to me. A carnal Christian can never know the truth. And can never teach the truth. It is a deceptive looking theology and doctrine. That's why when Paul wrote the epistles, he what? There's a fine line. You're a Christian, but be circumcised. You're, you're a Christian, but do what we do as the Jews. And then you're really going to be a Christian. Wow. Paul was able to see the heresy in that, going back to rules-based life, that nobody can become righteous before God with focusing on the rules, okay? Heresy, false teaching, false doctrine. It's in the flesh. Why? Because the Bible said spirit reveals it to your spirit. The flesh doesn't understand what the spirit of God reveals because the spirit is not teach the flesh. You cannot teach the flesh. You have to crucify the flesh. Who? The spirit, not you, not me. It's the spirit who will crucify the flesh. We'll just cooperate. Holy Spirit, crucify this flesh. It's very prideful. It loves the law. It likes the law because the law is about self-effort, self-righteousness, and therefore comes with pride, with boasting. But the Bible said you are saved by grace, not by your good works. It's a free gift from God so that no one will be proud and boasting before God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you know and understand grace, you will not be proud and having a superiority complex with somebody who reads only two chapters and you read ten chapters of the Bible. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's a Pharisee mentality. I'm not saying don't read ten chapters. But if you have a powerful and strong relationship with God, it's not about two or ten. You will read as much as you want because you want to get to know God more every day of your life. And you're not going to use your reading more to be superior and to be boastful in the presence of God and against another person. You are only a recipient of the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. It's all in the flesh. You cannot get to know truth if you're fleshly. How much more teach it? Pastor, are you angry? No, I'm excited. Because guys, this is liberating. It has liberated me. Because we don't want to be on the side of pride. We don't want to be on the side of, 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 of boasting. We don't want to be on the side. That's demonic. That is the devil's pitfall. Lucifer, removing his sight in worshiping God and started looking at, at himself. I'm just kind of like paraphrasing. There was a mirror in heaven. He stopped looking at God. He was one of the closest angels of God, right there in the presence of God, worshiping God, praising God. And then for a moment, he shifted and saw himself in the mirror. And he said, wow, 
I'm wonderful. I'm amazing. I'm beautiful. I can be like God. I don't have to be the first level of God. I don't have to be under God. I can now be like God. And I should be worshipped. And that was the beginning of his fall because of his pride. And he was cast away from heaven. And he take on the form of evil. Lucifer, the son of the morning, became evil, ugly, an accuser. You got this? And the angels became becoming demons. One third of the angels. So this is in the flesh. Some more. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, not just from time to time, but it becomes a lifestyle, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the, say with me, work of the Spirit? No, 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 listen to me. Is it the work of the Spirit? No, it's the fruit. Fruit means you're not as a branch trying to produce fruit on your own. All you have to do is stay connected to the body, the trunk, and that is Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay with me. <laughs> it becomes a fruit, not fruits. Fruit. Why? Because if you have the Holy Spirit producing the fruit, you have all of these manifold sides. Of the fruit of the Spirit. Some say that the, the, the primary fruit is love and it comes with joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. But if you, if you allow the Spirit to lead you, to, you walk in the Spirit, you yield to the Spirit, you trust the power of Jesus Christ, you lean on the ability of Christ, you lean on the finished work of Christ. Take note, finished work. You're not trying to produce any other work. But just stay with Jesus, be connected to Jesus, love Jesus, yield to Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Then he takes care of the flesh and he produces the fruit. And it's not like, this is human nature. Oh, I'm sometimes loving, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I have peace. No, it's not like that. That's, this is not inconsistent. This is consistently Holy Spirit fruit. It's either you have it or you don't have it. It's either you're faking it, it's either I'm faking it, it's either it's just flesh trying to be nice, but it cannot be consistently and fully nice. It's evil. It's selfish. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and people will see the change in you. Gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. Wow. First question we need to ask. We won't take long with this. Do we really want an intimate relationship with the Holy God? Let me ask again the question. Do we really want a relationship, an intimate one, with the Holy God? Anybody here, you're meticulously clean and tidy at home. Raise up your hand. Meticulously tidy, clean. Malinis. Nasa kamay. It's okay. And then you're marrying somebody who, what we call in Tagalog, burara. Socks here, tissue after using the toilet on the floor, toothpaste all over the countertop. Are you? <laughs> Can you live with that? That's just constant irritations and triggers every day, right? You're meticulously clean. You're just very tidy. And then that's why we ask these questions before they get married. Or somebody, you're get, getting married to a person and the person said, I will be faithful to you for 364 days in a year, but give me one day to go back to my, my fling. Or vice versa. Would you marry that? So you think there's, there, it's okay with the holy God, thrice holy God, no sin, so pure, holy, so above everything, not common, that, oh, okay, I have some petty sins, I have some little sins that I can ke keep in this relationship. No, no, no way, Jose. It's different when you're failing because you're weak. It's different because you're sinning when you're sinning because you still want to. That's a different ball game. So the question is, do we really want an intimate relationship with the Holy God? In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, this is what God said concerning Jesus. That's why he anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness. Meaning Jesus 
or meaning God the Father gave Jesus gladness. Why? You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Hindi lang yung, not just like a little bit hate. I love Jesus 98%, but I, 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 I love some bit of sin. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, take note. Take note of this. You see that the, the, the source of joy is loving righteousness and hating lawlessness? It's not circumstances. It's not more money, less triggers. Now, I'm talking about spiritual here, okay? Different when it's biological. Chemical imbalance. Again, that's different. But I'm talking about here. If you love righteousness and hate, law, hate, hate lawlessness, God gives you joy. The fruit of one of the multifaceted fruit of the Spirit. Right? So, the only way you and I can have an intimate relationship with the Holy God is answering the second question. Do we really want sin out of our life? That is why legalism is very enticing. That is why all the other stuff in the flesh, sinful things, is very enticing because there is a delusion of happiness and fulfillment in it to begin with. It feels good. When you place yourself under the law and you have done more, if you have placed yourself in a rules-based relationship or religion and you think that is the way to get approval before God, there is a satisfying feeling that you have done something. And that is human nature. We are a very prideful human. We have a very prideful human nature. Very prideful. This is very prideful, this human nature. I have done a lot. I have given a lot. I have read a lot. I have obeyed more than anybody else. I have obeyed more than this, this, this publican. I have given my tithes. I fast twice a week. Uh, I have obeyed the law. I'm a Pharisee. But yeah, that guy is evil. <laughs> That's in the flesh. Religion, religiosity, self-value, self-effort, self-righteousness, and then pride, it's in the flesh. There's a sense of happiness to begin with. L what about vindictiveness? What about bitterness? What about vengeance? Somebody hurt you, offended you. And then you saw somebody, oh, that person really attacked me and offended me. Now he has COVID. You have a sense of like justice and you feel good a bit. But eventually, my friend, you know what is the end result of bitterness? It will torture you. Have you heard or read the parable of the unforgiving servant? He was forgiven by his master and the unforgivable debt. The master had mercy on him. And then he saw his co-servant who owed him something that was not even significant, a petty amount. But he, what? Picked him up and threw him into prison. And the master heard about it from other servants. And what did the master say? Throw this unforgiving servant to the torturers. It felt good because he felt superior. He felt vindicated. He, he felt justified in attacking this sinning or offending brother who owed him something. This is offending uh, a servant. And then applied his own definition of justice without mercy and threw the guy, the poor guy, into prison. He felt good about it. But now after, this is what bitterness would do. It, it feels good to begin with, to be vindictive, to be vengeful, uh, to attack back, but eventually it tortures you. It poisons you. You know what sin is all about? Sin tastes good to begin with. The devil sugarcoats it. When the devil tempted Eve, what did, what did he say? Oh, look, it's good for food. Tastes good. And it will make you like God. See? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and then the pride of life. It will make you like God. Satan was passing his genes, his sinful predisposition, character, heart, to this pure Eve and Adam. And it was covered with tasty sugar to hide a double-edged sword. So the question is, you want to have an intimate relationship with the Holy God, but do we really want sin out of our life? That's a question that you and I will answer. Even giving up the sense of satisfaction of the, 
the sin that you are still in, tasting it, but you're also feeling the pain of it. Like looking at a little bit of some pornographic picture that eventually led to more viewing, led to more viewing, reading, and led to more thoughts and actions that are immoral and ungodly and impure. That has a mental, emotional consequence. Because the Bible said, if you're in the flesh, there's condemnation. You feel condemned. You feel guilt. I'll talk about this. That's why there are so many Christians that are restless. They don't have the rest of the victory of Jesus. They're very restless. Because condemnation is restlessness. That's in the flesh, Romans 8.1. If you're in the Spirit, there's no condemnation. If you're living, led by the Spirit, yielded to the Spirit, you hate sin, you hate lawlessness, and you love God, and you love righteousness, then there's no condemnation. The Spirit is the one leading you, tugging you, and empowering you. But if you don't hate sin the, more, the, the way Jesus hated sin, and you don't love God the way Jesus loved God, with all of your heart, then there's going to be condemnation because sin is still dominant. It's constant. I'll give you uh, an illustration. The Eskimos are mostly living in Siberia, of Russia, and in Alaska. You know Alaska used to be Russia? part of Russian uh, territory. They sold it for $20 million, so kind of split the Siberian indigenous population. They have, a, they have a very strategic and wise way of trapping wild dogs or wild animals. They will have a double-edged knife, and they would coat it with, um, they would coat it with blood and then freeze it. And then put another coat, another layer, and then freeze it. Another coat, and then freeze it. What you see now is a popsicle of blood covering a two-edged knife. And so they would bury the handle on the ground and expose the knife that looks like a bloody popsicle. Now, wild dogs and animals that are hunted, are, they're, they're a powerful a, a sense of smell. And so the wild dogs will follow the, that smell of blood until they find that, that, that sugar, uh, that blood-coated knife and start to lick. The more the, the animal tastes the blood, the more he licks fast and faster and faster and faster. Until finally the, the icicle or the, the popsicle, the ice, the, the frozen blood is consumed, he starts licking the knife. Because of the satisfaction that that blood provides him, he would not feel it fully feel the pain of the knife slicing his tongue or its tongue and keeps on leaking and faster and faster without knowing that this animal was already leaking its own blood, leaking its own blood until he runs out of blood and drops and dies. That is what sin is. That is what the carnal, fleshly desires and attitudes and mindsets do to us. It can be religious, let me tell you. That's a very, one of the most deceptive works of the flesh is religiosity. That's why Paul dealt with it. It looks like Christ. It looks like the gospel, but it's filled with pride. It's filled with self-effort. It's filled with self-righteousness. It is not dependence on the strength of Christ, the finished work of Christ, and out of gratitude, you live it in the power of the Spirit. Striving has no rest. It's restlessness. Surrender and faith gives you the righteousness, the victory of Jesus, and the peace and the joy of the Spirit. And you have restless. You have a restful disposition. I would like to conclude this with my own experience. For a time being, I struggled with anxiety. Say with me, anxiety. Come on, say with me, anxiety. I struggled with anxiety, and I struggled with anxiety all the way when I was a child. In an anger you know, an angry environment, you develop anxiety. And I didn't realize that I carried it on into my Christian life, born-again life. And it manifests if I'm carnal or if I was carnal, meaning I don't want to give up the, 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 the satisfaction of sinning yet to God. Cut the long story short, this anxiety became worse and worse and worse until it was really beyond bare. And I cried and cried to God and I cried to God until finally God showed to me 
that I have two major rooted roots of sin. One is, remember, be careful of a wicked, evil heart. I had pride. Pride. A high esteem of self, not according to the way God sees me, and not according to you know, a, a, a healthy sense of humility that comes from the, being a recipient of the mercy and the grace of God. And I had this pride. It makes me easily angry, e- not easily forgiving, and a little bit of being vindictive. And, and, you know, I can easily hide it. We can easily hide it. We don't want to expose it. We show it with so many religious jargons and words. Oh, I've forgiven him. I let him go. But, <laughs> but. And God showed it to me. Thank God he had mercy. Second was, I doubted God. See, two evil, pride and unbelieving heart. Remember? Be careful. I'd show it, uh, see. In Hebrews 3.12, we'll complete, continue this next week. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving turning you away from the living God. I didn't know this, that I had this in my heart. I, I, I was proud. I was angry. I was bitter. And then I also doubted God. Because there were things that happened in our lives that God, I felt that God did not respond favorably to our prayers. And there will be times I would still be praying, praying long, praying in tongues, singing, but deep down in my heart, you don't answer my prayers. You're not really who you are who you said you are. And until, you know what, this kind of heart was killing me. It felt satisfactory to begin with. It felt good. It's not really satisfying. It felt good because that's what sin does. But it was already killing me. I was becoming more and more anxious, stressful, easily irritated and angry until finally I broke down in the presence of God and said, God, I'm sorry for being proud. I'm sorry for being bitter. I'm sorry for doubting you. I repent and I simply, Lord, don't want this kind of a heart anymore. And I turn my life over to you. This is Pastor Juni, a pastor, praying this prayer. And when I prayed it in response to the mercy and the grace of God, I felt forgiveness and freedom. Let me give you, I approached a person that I carried a grudge and I said, I'm sorry I carried a grudge against you. It was, that, was, that was, in the natural, that's too hard to do. But in the spirit, I just felt the peace, the joy, the freedom, and I was reminded because repentance has restitution. Restitution. Remember what, 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 what Zacchaeus did? Lord, I'll give you half of my money. Half the, no, I'll give half of my money to the poor, and if I have stolen anything from anybody, I'll give it fourfold. See? Restore. So I went to the person and said, I'm sorry, I've carried the grudge against you. Please forgive me. I don't want to talk into detail because I don't think that's the right way, but I am being responsible for being bitter and carrying a grudge, and I ask for your forgiveness. And you know what? How, 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 jo- how joyful and peaceful that was. How liberating that was. Not because I was blaming him, blaming her. No, that's, that won't get you anywhere. But admitting my evil heart and my unbelief. And then the grace of God, like a dew, came into my broken heart and healed me. Now gave me the power, oh, the fruit of the Spirit. Not perfect, still being sanctified. I still have the struggle with the psyche sometimes. That's why we need to have our minds renewed with the Word. I don't read it because I have to. I read it because I am hungry for more of Jesus, more of His Word, more of His revelation. Oh, more of his illumination. I want to get to know you more. God, you're amazing. And he gives me the power to overcome the flesh, the old mindset, and enjoy the goodness of God. Enjoy the rest of God and enjoy more fruits. Fruit of the Spirit and the fruits of ministry and life. My, my friends, I'm not preaching something head knowledge. I'm preaching something that changed my life here. Not in heaven, right here. So going back to the question, I would like all of us to stand up. You know, this is what John Piper said. How do we walk in the Spirit? How do we get sin out of our lives? Or like the flesh not ruling? 
Satan ruling through the flesh over us. You know what he said? It takes our will, but not willing to change. It's not like, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to read more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to go to church more. Even if the church is closed, I'll go to church. No, it's not willing to change. No, it's willing to be intimate with the holy God. <laughs> That's just it. In willing because I don't want sin anymore. I don't want doubt anymore. I don't, I don't want lust anymore. I don't want pride anymore. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, I ask for your power to overcome. Because he who walks in the Spirit, he who is led by the Spirit, will overpower the cravings. You cannot will to overpower. No, you can only will to say, yes, Jesus, I want to be intimate with the Holy God. Yes, Jesus, I don't want sin anymore. I repent. That's when the Spirit comes and gives you the power to overpower the cravings of the sinful flesh. Are you getting this? And starts producing the fruit, not yours, the fruit. Consistently everything, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. Consistently like all of those in the same level growing in you and you and you. You get this? Guys, are you getting this? Well, we have to deal with those tough questions. Do we really want an intimate relationship with the Holy God? How do we do that? Do we really want sin out of our lives? It's just yes or no. Where is the struggle? Indecisiveness. A double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. James chapter 1. But don't be lured and be deceived by, oh, it tastes good. It's going to kill you it's sin. If it's the fleshly desires and pride, it's going to kill you. Kill your relationship with God. Kill your soul. You will never know the peace of God. You will never know the grace of God, the joy of the Lord, the forgiveness of the Lord in that state, in that carnal state. Because it's a gift, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So I would like every eyes closed and, you know, say, say yes if you want to say yes. Yes, Lord, I want to be close to a holy God. Yes, I want sin out of my heart. I don't want to cuddle, nurture, bitterness, lust, pornography, pride, superiority complex. I don't want to go back to the law, self-effort, working my way into approval before God. No. Surrender that. Jesus already died for you. Jesus already paid for your forgiveness and my forgiveness. Jesus already paid for our right standing before God. Just trust. Just believe. Talk to Jesus right now. Talk to Him right now. Say yes if that's what you response is. Without your goodness, and ask for help if you're struggling. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the dark. If it wasn't for the cross, oh, praise you, praise you, you have won me with your kindness. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your me sufficient, powerful grace. I was lost. Freely, we have received. Where you, would I be? Help those who are struggling with indecisiveness, double-mindedness. Help us, God, to repent really. Oh, hallelujah. Lawlessness and sin and carnality. Thank you, Jesus. And embrace you as our holy God to be intimate with the Holy Help us, Jesus. It's with your blood you brought my freedom. Hallelujah. You know what? This is not hard to decipher or discern. Are you easily angered? Then that's the manifestation of your flesh. That is what has been programmed through the years. You're always angry, irritable, impatient. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no fruit of the Spirit because the work of the flesh is the one that brings you condemnation. More of the devil whispering thoughts that down you, put you down. It's simple. Say, God, I don't want to be like this anymore. <laughs> I don't want. 
Help me. Help remove this block blockages to our in intimate relationship. It's already forgiven, paid for, but you have to acknowledge those things and repent of those things. And then desire God above rules, above laws, above anything. It's desiring that I may know you. Amen? The question is, do we want? That's the struggle. Not the flesh. Not the devil. Jesus overcame the flesh. Jesus overcame the devil. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He overcame the devil. He overcame the flesh on the cross. He overcame the devil even before the cross because he chose to love righteousness and hate lawlessness. Are you with me? It's not like, oh, I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time. The flesh is powerful. The devil is so strong. No, they were all both defeated, annihilated by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know the struggle? The indecisiveness. I leave it up to you. Father, help us to hate lawlessness, hate sin, hate the demonic, hate, hate the sensual, hate all kinds of evil. Love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your righteousness. Love you. And appreciate your grace. All because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, grace and peace abound to all of you in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Enjoy free gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. If you wish to connect with us online, here are our social media accounts where you could follow us or watch live stream videos of our services. And here's our website where you can join a life group, give online, and watch past videos and many more. Again, my name is Jenny, and here's WhatsApp at IWC.